Fox Studios in New York City. This is Maria Bartiromo's Wall Street. And happy weekend to all. Welcome to the program that analyzes the week that was and helps position you for the week ahead. I'm Maria Bartiromo. The mainstream media bending over backwards to rebrand Kamala Harris's role in the Biden administration. Harris was... Um put in charge, as you said earlier, of combating the roots of immigration. She was not and is not the border czar. She was never appointed border czar. She was put in charge of diplomatic efforts with the so-called Northern Triangle. People gonna have to counter the misinformation. You already hear folks talking about the border czar. She wasn't the border czar. She did diplomacy in Central America. She is not the border czar. To the extent there's right. anybody who's a border czar, it's the Secretary of Homeland Security. Well, they all got the memo. Time, USA Today, Daily News, all quick to deny Harris was ever tapped for border duty. And the New York Times out with their own story, making sure voters think Harris only had a limited role in the progressive economic policies of the Biden administration. It's convenient for Democrats that their candidate is, according to them, not responsible for the two top issues facing voters right now. This, as a new head-to-head -head poll, shows Trump leading Harris by just one point. Joining me now to talk more about it is former Utah Congressman Jason Chaffetz and former Obama economic advisor Robert Wolf. Both are Fox News contributors. Gentlemen, great to see you both. Thank you so much for being here. We so appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I, let me kick it off with you, Robert. Was there a talking point memo that went around to ensure that the media would not call her border czar or would forget everything that Joe Biden said she was in charge of? Um, listen, uh, we know that there was a great bipartisan deal that could have been done that would have changed the border and immigration policy uh, just a few months ago. And that would have been incredibly game changing for immigration reform. But, um, you know, former President Trump didn't want to have that win for the Biden-Harris administration. So it was, uh, you know, it was dead in the House. But uh, when you have someone like a conservative senator like Langford putting it forward, um, I'm surprised that we didn't um, do what was best for the country and proceed. No, I don't know how game changing it would have been with all due respect. It, it allowed, I, I guess, one and a half million people into the country on a yearly basis. And I think that was part of the pushback from conservatives. But look, I'm talking about the rebranding of, of Kamala Harris. And, and this is a serious question, Jason Chaffetz. I, I understand that on TikTok, there's all these new memes uh, saying how great Kamala Harris has been as vice president. And I'm wondering if this is coming from the Chinese Communist Party, since it's on TikTok, uh, who may want Kamala in there uh, to continue a soft on China policy. What is your reaction to this rebranding of Kamala Harris uh, these last few days? Yeah, they're totally trying to whitewash what she did and more importantly, what she didn't do. She was the vice president of the United States. She doesn't just get to excuse herself from, oh, the two biggest issues, the economy and immigration. To say that she didn't do anything, she wasn't responsible for anything. Well, how, how convenient is that? Um, look, the border has always been one of our top, top concerns. So what did she do? What was the conclusion? It was climate change that was driving millions of people here? Didn't have anything to do with maybe the enticement of, you know, open borders and free health care? She, she literally wants to give every single person that comes here free health care, free education, free housing, give them a phone, and then she wonders why there are millions of people that came here? And as it relates to the economy, does she even have a clue how the economy even works? I, 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 the idea that, hey, we're just going to, you know, clear her record. She didn't do anything for the last three and a half years. I think America's going to see through that. Well, you know, Robert, I want to take, I want you to take that on and, and give us your point of view on that. Because, you know, there are reports right now that dozens of Kamala's Wall Street supporters joined that private Zoom call this week to strategize on a path to victory against Donald Trump. Robert, you were on the call. What can you tell us about the concerns, about what was said about Kamala Harris and whether or not she is going to resonate with voters? Yeah, I mean, there was a call. It was about 40, you know, Wall Street executives and CEOs. Uh, it went incredibly well. I mean, partly because we have a different view than Jason has on the economy. Um, jobs have gone up. Wages have gone up. Inflation has come down. The deficit has come down dramatically since Trump. And um, there's a real debate to have on the economy. And I think that should be front and center. And there's going to be an incredible number of business surrogates that will support um, this idea of Kamala Harris uh, for president. So, um, 
you know, uh, we should have that debate about the economy. Unfortunately, Maria, Maria with, you know, a 60, 90 day sprint, it feels like all these ads are going to be more personal attacks on each side. I hope we're able to have this real public uh, policy debate because it's it's one that should be front and center. Yes. And I look forward to having that debate with any Republican that wants to come on to debate the Biden-Harris economy versus Trump economy. Jason, what about that? Uh, I, I want to get your take as well on the economic backdrop and foreign policy because former President Trump uh, is met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu Friday, one day after uh, Netanyahu met separately with President Biden and uh, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, the Vice President Axios reporting that Netanyahu was upset by the public comments that Harris made after their meeting. His officials are warning that they could harm the negotiations over a Gaza hostage and ceasefire deal. Watch this. To everyone who has been calling for a ceasefire and to everyone who yearns for peace, I see you and I hear you. What has happened in Gaza over the past nine months is devastating. We cannot look away in the face of these tragedies. We cannot allow ourselves to become numb to the suffering, and I will not be silent. Axios is reporting that Minnesota's uncommitted delegates to the DNC will not support Harris until she commits to ending military aid to Israel. This is a real balance she's walking as concern among Jewish voters grows over the potential of a rise in anti-Semitism under a Harris presidency. Jason. Uh, she has not been a world leader on this issue. This is, I, I thought we had an ironclad relationship with Israel. Mm -hmm. And instead of talking about the heinous attack that happened on Israel and the fact that there are still, to this day, American hostages, what I don't hear from Vice President Harris is saying, you give us our hostages back, then we'll begin to have this discussion. She is not definitive. She does not know how to negotiate. As she said, I've never even been to Europe. She doesn't understand understand the world staged and she's been trying to get this lesson for the last three and a half years America and the world have suffered under her so-called leadership she supposedly went to Guatemala to talk about climate change and try to figure out immigration but when it comes to Israel she thinks there's an there's a moral equivalent between Israel and what Hamas a terrorist organization did in slaughtering people and doing what they do if she wants to end the violence be definitive but she is not. She is trying to waver and she's trying to get those votes out of Minneapolis, for goodness sake, rather than doing what's right for the world and the country. Robert, what do you say? Well, as someone who's uh, Jewish and whose family uh, was impacted by the Holocaust, my yeah. grandparents are from Russia and uh, Poland and all of their, uh, their family died. So this is, uh, this is personal to me. This isn't political. Of course. Um, I've had conversations both with the vice president as well as the uh, second gentleman. Uh, and I went to the, the United Nations forum that he had. Uh, it's clear that um, you know, they are not wavering on their support for Israel. And I think if you, you heard them, they said that the security of Israel is front and center. But it's also clear that, they're, that what's going on from a human rights perspective, um, we have to make sure that this food insecurity that's happening um, changes and we all want a ceasefire, but we all want hostages released first and but immediately. I don't see the U.S. Uh, I don't see the U.S. wavering at all in their support of Israel, irrespective of whether it's a Republican nor Democratic president. And we've heard, you know, a, a lot of uh, innuendos, but uh, th this administration has not wavered. What a moment in time, gentlemen. It's a uh, opportunity, a great opportunity to speak with you both on these uh, very important issues. Thank you, sirs. Good to see you both. Jason Thank Chaffetz you. and Robert Wolf. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve's preferred gauge of inflation easing slightly, but Americans are not feeling it. Former Federal Reserve Governor Kevin Warsh is here on where the economy goes from here. Stay with us. Welcome back. Here's a look at where markets ended another wild week with the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq logging their worst day in two years on Wednesday. Stocks then turned higher after we saw stronger than expected economic growth for the second quarter. And then the Fed's favorite inflation gauge came in in line with expectations. The annualized rate slightly easing, but still above 2 percent on PCE inflation. Joining me now is former Federal Reserve Governor Kevin Warsh. It is great to see you, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Maria, great to be back with you. 
Assess the macro story for us today. Sure. So the real economy is weakening, and the bottom half of the population feels it more than the top half. All the excess savings they got in the post-COVID world, they've spent it. So the bottom half of consumers are pulling back, and inflation continues to eat away at wages. Sure, the data on inflation, Maria, has gotten a bit better, but inflation is still running closer to 3% than 2%. And over the last three and a half years, that means inflation's running around 23% higher than it was a few years ago. So real Americans are, are feel, feeling that pinch. Uh, but I suppose, if anything, the trajectory of inflation is going in the right direction. But prices aren't stable, and that's really what the Fed's mission is. Yeah, and what you're saying cert certainly is in step with what we're seeing from polls. We've got a new poll this week that shows people are not feeling the economy is getting better. Roughly three in five Americans believe the U.S. is currently in a recession. Credit card delinquency is now at their highest levels in nearly uh, 12 years, according to the Philadelphia Federal Reserve. Kevin, I want to get your take on, on, on what changes this. How do you get out of this slump? What are the policies that you believe could get us out of this. So the American people, Maria, as you point out, they're smart. They get this. They understand the country's on the wrong track. They understand the economy's on the wrong track. Sure, they ha they're happy that they have a job, but they know these sets of policies of spending money we don't have, printing money we don't have, borrowing from overseas, it can get you through November, it can get you through the year, but that's not a long-term sustainable strategy. That's not how they run their households, and I think they're increasingly worried that's not how the government should be running. So what do you do? You reverse these policies. You spend money that you can afford. You don't have the government get bigger and bigger. The government under the budget that the president and vice president have put up some months ago will have government spending relative to the size of the economy, the largest in American history. And that's going to crowd out private investment, ultimately hurt employment. So listen, the government's been goosing things. The government tried to keep rates at zero for a long time, only to have inflation really put this terrible tax on hardworking middle class Americans. The Fed's now trying to compensate for it. But the American people have figured out that they need a change in policies. They need prudent fiscal policy, prudent monetary policy and a deregulatory tax. And they can be hopeful that that's possible come 2025. And let's talk the Fed for a moment. Next week, you've got the July monetary policy meeting, a two-day meeting, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, and then, of course, the next meeting in September. All bets are on the Fed to cut rates in September. What are you expecting from next week's meeting in terms of language? And what about that September cut? Yeah. Are you among them expecting it? Yeah, so uh, I'll give my predictions. The Fed has been very eager to cut interest rates. Chairman Powell last December at his meeting promised a whole bunch of rate cuts coming this year. Markets have frankly been pricing those. Markets have expected those. And uh, they're eager to cut rates even as inflation continues to be high and volatile. I believe they're going to do it. I believe they're going to cut interest rates in September. I believe they'll cut interest rates in, in December. And, uh, and uh, they're going to deliver on what they've said. The problem, I think, for financial markets is most of that's already been priced in. And they have to continue to be concerned, that is, businesses and households, that they might not have slayed the inflation dragon quite yet. Yeah, great points all around. Kevin, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. I hope you'll come back soon. Thanks, Maria. Kevin Warsh joining us. Quick break, and then Kamala Harris's track record on taxes. Grover Norquist, president at Americans for Tax Reform, on what a potential Harris presidency could mean for the economy and your wallet. Next. I am proposing that we change the tax code so for every family that is making less than $100,000 a year, they will receive a tax credit that they can collect up to $500 a month, which will make all the difference between those families being able to get through the end of the month with dignity and with support or not. And on day one, I will repeal that tax bill that benefits the top 1% and the biggest corporations of America and I actually feel very strongly about this, is that we need to have Medicare for all. Having a system that makes a difference in terms of who receives what based on your income is unconscionable, it is cruel, and in many situations that I have witnessed, inhumane. That's Kamala Harris, 2019 campaign proposals and her record in the Senate in focus as she hits the campaign trail this week. In the past, the vice president pushed for increased taxes across the board to pay for progressive programs such as Medicare for All. 
This includes bumping capital gains taxes to 35 percent, uh, increasing the estate tax. If Harris is able to secure the presidency and implement any of these policies, what impact could it have on the economy and middle class Americans? Joining me now, Americans for Tax Reform President Grover Norquist. Grover, thanks very much for joining us this weekend. What kind of uh, proposals are you expecting from Kamala Harris and what kind of an impact might you expect? She has a series of tax increases, many of them much worse, more radical, more devastating to the economy than even what Biden put forward. Uh, the Biden administration, along with Kamala, came out for a capital gains tax of 44.6 percent, 44.6 percent, twice China's. Who's going to invest in the United States if Kamala and Biden got their way on that one? Uh, the president, uh, Biden, wants to take the corporate income tax from 21 percent, which is sort of competitive with Europe, up to 28 percent, higher than Europe, higher than China. Uh, Kamala has said 35 percent. She wants to take that rate up to 35 percent, which, of course, makes it significantly higher than China. Why would you invest or build a factory in the United States if we're at 35 and they're at 15 to 25? It'd be higher than anything in Europe, higher than Venezuela. Uh, just she wants more. She wants a carbon tax. She's been much clearer about the carbon tax even than Biden was. And the carbon tax leads inevitably to a value added tax because they want to extend the tax on energy to all things as they do uh, in Europe. There is and a financial uh, transaction tax, which has usually been something out in left wing Gaga land. She's endorsed that uh, along with the senator from Vermont, who is out in Gaga land, uh, and she holds hands with him and supports the idea of putting a tax every time there's a financial tax action in the country. The vice president also pushed for universal basic income in her time as a U.S. senator. Harris proposed $2,000 monthly payments for Americans making less than $100,000 a year in 2020 and an additional $2,000 for up to three children. What effect would that kind of policy have on the U.S. taxpayer, Grover? Well, it would. It simply increases the number of people who would become dependent on welfare and end up not working. One of the challenges we have in the Kamala Biden economy is that welfare payments are so high and inflation is so damaging to uh, wages that people are not coming back to work. Uh, the, the percentage of the population of working age that is working is not growing. It's it's falling and it's it's a significant problem uh, that workers are not coming out to work because of things like Kamala's idea of throwing more welfare. She's also dropped the comment by Biden, the lie Biden told that he'd only tax people who made less than 400,000, uh, more than 400,000. I'm going to tax people who make more than 400,000. Then he said, well, actually, it, it, the married couple, it's only 200,000. Oh, and by the way, inflation is such that it goes even lower, that he has made uh, people more and more susceptible. Her idea of the taxes she wants to raise, particularly on energy, will hit everyone. And the corporate income tax, as she well knows, is paid not by some guy named Mr. General Motors. It's paid by workers in lower wages directly. It's paid by all Americans in higher prices. And it's paid by retirees in reduced pensions, 401ks, IRAs that are damaged by those tax. The corporate income tax hits middle America first and last. That's yeah. who pays it. The left likes it because it's a hidden tax, but it's a tax on middle America. Yeah, Harris has also pushed uh, radical health care policy. She's backing Medicare for all. I want to get your take on this. That abolishes private health insurance, even insuring illegal uh, immigrants. Uh, again, uh, the wide open border has had huge effects. And here she says everybody should have insurance. Yes. She wants to have the government take over everything on health care. Already the government does too much on health care and it raises prices. It raises costs. The way Canada and some of the European countries deal with those higher prices is they ration care. If you're over 75 percent, five years old, this is not a good deal for you. Yeah. All right. We will leave it there. Grover, it's great to get your take on all of this. Of course, we'll keep a spotlight on it. Thank you, sir. You got it. Grover Norcrest joining us. I've got one important thing you need to know about ahead of next week. That's it. Welcome back. One thing you need to know about ahead of next week, you can own a piece of history from an NBA Hall of Fame icon. The late Kobe Bryant's personal locker from the Staples Center is up for auction. 
The L.A. Lakers used this locker for the majority of his legendary career, including five NBA championships. Sotheby's estimates it will go for one to one and a half million dollars, and part of the proceeds will benefit the Los Angeles Lakers Youth Foundation, empowering children through sports. The winning bidder will also receive a scrapbook and poster from Kobe's final game. We'll be following it all on Mornings with Maria weekdays, 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Join us here on Fox Business. And I'll see you on Sunday morning over on the Fox News Channel at 10 a.m. Eastern live for Sunday Morning Futures. I've got exclusive interviews this weekend with Congressman Byron Donalds, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, former presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, and the Government Accountability Institute President Peter Schweitzer. Join us live Sunday morning on Fox News. That'll do it for us here on Fox Business. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your weekend, and I'll see you again next time.